Welcome to Direct Talk. Our guest today is Yuko Shirakawa, a nurse at Doctors Without Borders. The international non-governmental organization brings medical care to places where local health care infrastructure is unable to cope and where large numbers of lives are in danger due to war, natural disaster or disease. The organization was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1999. Shirakawa has been deployed nearly 20 times in war-torn regions, including Syria and Yemen, since beginning her work with the group in 2010. We asked Shirakawa about medical needs in the battlefield and what they face in conflict zones. In all the wars I've seen, in every country I've been to, in every region, you have innocent, regular civilians, people opposed to the war, people who hate war, people who love their families, people exactly like us, and they're the ones who are suffering, who are dying. I simply cannot abandon these people. That's why I go, I think. Doctors Without Borders. As the name suggests, the organization brings medical care to practically wherever it's needed. Syria, for example. Over 300,000 people have died in Syria's long civil war, and half the total population, roughly 10 million people, have been forced to leave the country. Doctors Without Borders has been providing medical care there for more than nine years now. This is South Sudan, where civil war has brought approximately 300,000 children to the brink of starvation. <laughs> Doctors Without Borders does not take sides in these conflicts. They go places even journalists have trouble getting access to and offer health care. If medical facilities in the area have been destroyed, they set up their own and work to save large numbers of lives. But of course, there are always huge challenges. In terms of equipment, we can do basic surgery, but maybe we only have one operating room, one artificial respirator that we're using on someone we've given anesthesia. And if another patient arrives who needs the respirator, they're dying and all you can do is watch. Those are the kinds of situations we deal with. You're always thinking things like, if only we had one more operating room, if only we had one more surgical team, then things would be different. Providing medical care in a war zone is tremendously difficult. And Doctors Without Borders doesn't just treat injuries. Medical treatment isn't just, okay, we saved your life, we're done here. Real treatment is making sure that person leaves the hospital, returns to their home to normal life. Only then can you say you provided treatment. And of course, it's not just surgical operations. People have emotional wounds too. They need psychological support. Let's say someone had broken bones or you had to amputate to save their life. So now, how does that person return? home? How do they live their life? You have to think about that. In emergency medical situations, you don't really have time. But afterwards, we work to get them physical rehab teams, psychological support teams. That's part of our work. One thing I always do is learn my patients' names. I call them by name. Even if things get crazy and patients keep coming and going, I remember names and use them as much as I can. I think this shows my personal respect for each and every patient. That's my thinking. Shirakawa joined Doctors Without Borders in 2010 when she was 36. She'd admired the group ever since she was a girl and learned about their work on TV. 
She worked as a nurse in Japan and went abroad to study language at age 30 before joining up. Basically, I wanted to absorb everything that I saw. Of course, a lot of things came as a surprise. But as a medical professional, going to places where people needed medical care and delivering that care was such a joy for me. That's how I felt. I found the field that was right for me. I felt so glad. However, during her second year with the organization, she had an experience in Syria beyond anything she'd ever imagined. It was 2012, and the Syrian civil war was quickly intensifying. Gravely wounded patients were being carried into the clinic where Shirakara was based one after another. Many of them died. Eventually, hospitals themselves became targets of attacks. I felt the first impact when I was in the OR. It shook the earth, the bombing. I felt it in my stomach. There was all this shaking. Seriously, it was like these shock waves were hitting you from every direction around you. It was terrifying, <laughs> truly. Shirakawa was forced to evacuate Syria immediately. Back in Japan, she was tormented by the thought that providing medical care in a conflict zone was a hopeless cause. She considered quitting the nursing profession altogether. No matter how many people you save, someone else comes in covered in blood. I couldn't see any end to our work. Doing medical work in a place like that, it's not the work that will bring an end to the war. I felt so angry about that. I felt angry with myself. It was this profound dilemma. I thought I needed to become a journalist and tell people about what was happening in these places. Babies torn apart, their guts spilling out of their bodies. People being carried in who have no legs. People being carried in with bones jutting out through their skin. How could anybody imagine a situation like that actually going on? I wanted to tell people. But when I actually talked to journalists, they stopped me in my tracks. They said, you're a nurse. You becoming a journalist isn't going to put an end to war. There are already plenty of journalists, including myself. You need to get back to these conflict zones and keep saving people's lives. No, it was complicated. But the fact is, in this world, conflict doesn't stop. Requests for me to go to these conflict zones kept coming. So I decided to take up the call again, but it was a heavy feeling. In 2013, Shirakawa returned to Syria. Extremist groups, including IS, were entering the fray. The civil war had become a quagmire. Allah. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Shirakawa continued her medical work down a path that seemed like a tunnel with no end in sight. One day, a girl was brought into her clinic. Before the war, the girl had just been a regular high school student. She was brought in the day of an air raid. Both of her legs had been seriously injured. We weren't going to amputate, but it seemed like she would never walk again. We couldn't fix her. And of course, she was in a lot of pain from her injuries. She was utterly dejected. She wasn't talking, wasn't smiling. I don't just work in the OR. I go around and check on patients in the ward and say hello to them, greet them by name, hold their hand. 
Those things are very important, I think, so I was doing that. And I wasn't getting much of a reaction from this girl. The same thing happened day after day, and then my posting came to end. It was time for me to go home. I wanted to tell the girl. I said to her, I have to go home, but even after I'm back in Japan, I never want to forget you. Let's take a picture together. And then I got a lucky break. The guy I asked to take the picture was this really funny Syrian nurse. He did whatever he could to make the girl laugh. And so in the end, we got this wonderful shot of the two of us. She had this big smile on her face. I was just so happy in that moment. I almost jumped on the poor girl. I gave her a hug. I felt truly glad that I had come back as a nurse. That's why I'm here, so I can hold this girl's hand, give her a hug. I thought, if I had become a journalist, I probably wouldn't have met this girl. I probably wouldn't have helped make her smile. It made me realize that as I continue my work as a nurse, even just holding someone's hand or giving someone a hug is nursing. It's caring for someone. Medical care in a conflict zone has its limits. That's what I used to think. Well, it does, really. And I was still wrestling with my anger and ambivalence as I thought this, but... There were still actions we could take to make things better. Our job is giving the best medical treatment we can and thinking of ways to do that. Holding hands, talking to people, remembering their names. I think those things are part of the best treatment. That girl had a huge impact on my thinking. After Syria, Shirakawa has continued her work in different conflict zones. And she says that, despite the difficulties of her work, she no longer thinks about quitting nursing. She also has a new guiding principle. Before I began going to war zones, I used to think peace was a given. I took it for granted. But in fact, peace is something we have to always be aware of and protect. I started thinking about things that way. In countries that have experienced conflict, there are people who say, I never thought war would happen in my country. If you're not careful, war creeps up on you, then one day suddenly it's there. I want countries that are enjoying peace, people who live in peace, to be aware of the fact that they need to protect that peace. I really want them to think about that. Bend your ear to the voice of your heart. I think your heart always holds the answer. If you follow your head, you're calculating, you're litigating, that's how you're thinking. It's hard to figure out what you really, truly want to do. But try to sense what your heart is telling you the voice coming from your heart. If you do that, your heart will tell you the thing you truly want to do. You'll figure it out. <laughs> Don't think with your head. Feel with your heart. I always try to bear that in mind, or rather, in heart. <laughs>